Hello and welcome to this conversation with the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. My name is Aaron Weiss. I'm the program coordinator. And I'm here in conversation with Sam Mickey, who is a PhD student in the Department of Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness. And we're also joined by Elizabeth McAnally, PhD student in Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness in the Integral Ecology track. Sam, I'll start with you. I'd like to hear from you about what brought you to the California Institute of Integral Studies and why specifically the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program interested you. Well, I guess really, I mean, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. And um, so to avoid going through my whole life history, mm -hmm. and I'm sure some early childhood experiences and things like that have a lot to do with it. But really, I'll just kind of start with some of my academic background and how that kind of was the platform from which I decided to come out to, uh, to CIS and to PCC in particular. Um, my bachelor's degree is in philosophy and with a, a minor in um, religious studies. And the philosophy program I was at is at the University of North Texas. And a big part of that program is environmental philosophy. And so their graduate degrees um, specialize in environmental ethics. And so I was just really interested in philosophy and religion and part of what was uh, just in every class, regardless of whether it had anything to do with the environment, every class would touch on elements of philosophy that had something to do with nature. And so more and more I got interested in how nature and the material world and the body were fundamental questions for philosophy. And so with that kind of focus, uh, I was really interested in a lot of interdisciplinary research, a lot of different sciences coming together, a lot of different philosophical approaches, uh, a lot of different religious worldviews. And so um, I stuck around at University of North Texas to do a master's degree and ended up doing it in interdisciplinary studies. So I was interested in those overall questions, but everything was breaking free of the normal sense of academic boundaries. Mm. So a normal program wasn't um, really able to hold my interest. So that's the interdisciplinary. And so then after finishing that, looking for a PhD program, I was looking for something that would allow me to explore more of philosophy and religion, particularly in the context of uh, nature, the body, the material world, those kind of ecological questions. And in just searching for those kind of programs, there really aren't a lot. There's not a lot of really interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary programs out there. And so CIS is one of the few places where there's um, a very deep commitment to that kind of thinking, to that kind of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary thinking. And at first I was attracted to the East-West Psychology program out here. And so that's actually what I first joined, um, was the PhD program in East-West Psychology. And in particular, what attracted me was the work of Ralph Metzner, who's done a lot of work with ecological psychology um, and a lot of the different areas of study that surround that. Um, after about a year in that program, I decided to switch over to the Philosophy, Cosmology, Consciousness program. And a big part of that was um, that there was a more intense interest in ecology and studies of the natural world going on in that program than the uh, psychology program. Um, so that was part of why I transferred. Another part of the reason was a couple professors in particular that were out here visiting, uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm. And they offered a class on religion and ecology. And that really sparked my interest, and I could see how what they were teaching was connected to the rest of what uh, PCC was about. Um, so after having taken that class, I talked to some of the faculty and uh, decided that it'd be best for me to go ahead and switch uh, into PCC. And it was a really good decision. I've been really happy about it. Um, and I think it's really similar to a lot of the things that brought um, Elizabeth into it. So Elizabeth, what brings you to these studies? Well, I was also at the University of North Texas studying philosophy and religion. And I got my bachelor's degree there and then decided to stay for my master's degree where I studied philosophy and environmental ethics. And studying the relationship between environmentalism and ecology with religion and philosophy was a big part of why I came to the California Institute of Integral Studies. I was working on my master's thesis at the University of North Texas studying a philosophy of water and I was writing my thesis whenever I decided to move out to California and I took the same class that Sam took with Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm on world religions and ecology and taking that 
class was very influential for me deciding that I wanted to get a PhD and further study the relationship between religion and ecology and philosophy and all sorts of things that that, that kind of um, ties together. I wonder if you, Sam, could help me understand why philosophy is important to ecology. You mentioned that embodiment and nature have become important themes for philosophers, so maybe you could touch on that. But ecologists are scientists, right? What interest would they have in, in philosophy or religion? Right, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because ecology is a science started in the late 19th century and it was um, really based on a lot of evolutionary theory and trying to um, understand better how organisms relate to their environments, how adaptation and natural selection happen. And so it's very much a mode of scientific inquiry. And then sometime in the 1960s and 70s, philosophers started really paying attention to ecology. And they noticed that there was something deep within the philosophical tradition that had kind of gotten lost. And that if you look at ancient philosophy, there wasn't a really firm boundary between philosophy and science. And there was a consistent inquiry into the natural world. So with people like Aristotle, where a philosophy of nature is fundamental to doing philosophy. And somehow all of that got lost and turned into uh, philosophy just dealing with metaphysical questions and then science was taking care of the facts of the natural world. Um, but what happens in ecology as a science of relationships is that a lot of the firm boundaries we have uh, between different academic disciplines no longer really hold up. They all need to come together to understand these relationships. So when you're understanding relationships between organisms and their environments, you're not just looking at objects, you're also looking at elements of nature or the cosmos or these larger um, themes that have philosophical roots to their meaning. So to really think about what nature is, what an organism is, um, what the human is and how the human relates to nature, how we're a part of nature but at the same time apart from nature, um, those are all questions that philosophy has to contribute. Um, and then likewise philosophy often dealing with theological and religious themes so that how does our relationship to nature also reflect our relationship to God or to the divine or whatever we consider to be ultimate reality. Um, so in particular that's come out with the ethical importance of thinking about these things. So it's environmental ethics that really spearheaded a lot of this return of nature and ecology into uh, philosophical inquiry. So overall I think one of the things that's happening is that philosophy is helping ecology be more holistic and ecology is helping philosophy get back down to earth, come to its senses, and actually apply itself to concrete issues that are currently facing humanity and the rest of the planet. Now, Elizabeth, you brought up a very fascinating theme of water studies. And I'm wondering if you could develop how the study of water is connected with the themes that Sam was just talking about, the philosophical ecology. Well, water is so important. You know, it permeates every aspect of life and, and water in religious traditions and in philosophical traditions is a major theme. There's like say in every world religion there are emphasis, emphases on um, water rituals and, and sacred texts that have to do with, with uh, the role of water for the people and likewise with uh, water in philosophy you have like the very first philosopher Thales said that water was the, the arche, the, the beginning, the source of all things. Mm -hmm. and, and he developed a whole philosophical system based on this, this primary relationship to the stuff of water. And so by studying, studying the role of water in the history of philosophy and in the history of religious traditions, then you can get a better sense of its importance for us today um, particularly in light of water crises that are going on around the world. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, um, pollution and water scarcity, overconsumption, climate change, um, the list goes on. And so, so I, I found that, that by looking at a particular element, in this case water, we can get a, a better sense of who we are as humans and our relationship to our past and our, our motivation of how to act 
to have a sustainable future. Sure. One of the things that interests me about a, a crossing of currents of philosophy and ecology is that ecology seems to be not only a set of theories but also practices of uh, uh, experimentation or, or other uh, uh, modes of access, right? Whereas philosophy is often interpreted to be a kind of armchair uh, discipline that's mostly oriented around reading and writing and talking. And it seems that one of the promises of an ecological philosophy or philosophical ecology is the integration of practice into, into philosophy. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on that or, or experience with that that you could share with us. Yeah, um, well, for me, the practice of Tai Chi is a really important entryway into, into philosophy and religion and integral studies in general. Um, by, by practicing this, uh, this way of flowing with um, Qi, the, the spiritual life force, the, the material substance that permeates the entire world, um, by getting involved with, with that kind of relationship, we are able to see that, that our body is made up of the same stuff that, that the world is made up of. And, and so by understanding that the flows of our body, including all of the elemental relationships of our body, are, are in a way imitating or, or maybe like um, it, they're a microcosm, they're a miniature of the, of the entire universe, then we are able to see that, that who we are is, like our, our role in the cosmos is very important and we can have a felt sense of that. So, so having um, practice-based philosophies um, that, that focus on Tai Chi or yoga or other kinds of, of embodied practices, um, we can see how, how engaging philosophy can be instead of just reading a book and, and learning in that kind of way. I love how you described chi as both a spiritual and a material uh, substance that pervades the world. Um, it makes me think that, that water has a similar significance of being a, a material element, but, that, but also elemental in a more traditional sense of the, the four great elements pervading all things. Um, now, Sam, I'd like to ask you some questions uh, along similar lines. It seems that the intersection of philosophy and ecology, uh, it may break down certain traditional barriers that are assumed between, say, spirit and matter in this case. And it seems that uh, some of the contemporary philosophical traditions coming out of Europe and the United States of the last hundred years are also similar, at least in this respect, of taking new perspectives on the philosophical tradition, of um, drawing out from it what had been marginalized and bringing it back into the center of philosophical um, interest and expression. So I'm wondering if you could um, amplify this for me, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and so that sort of movement for uh, philosophy to become more ecological is kind of part of this larger movement of philosophy really becoming a lot more creative than it has been. Um, so much in the history of philosophy gets marginalized and just isn't a question. And, um, and for instance, if you just look at the history of philosophy, it favors white men. Sure. And uh, the philosophical perspectives of uh, women and people of color are generally marginalized. Um, are also certain topics of discussion, mm -hmm. like discussions of like ghosts or vampires. Mm -hmm. That's discussion yeah. for mythology, right. cultural studies, but not really philosophy. It's not necessarily rational. Um, but there's been a variety of movements in 20th century philosophy that are starting to open that up and open up inquiry to a lot of different subjects so that we're starting to include voices from men, women, people of color, um, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgenders. And so part of that also, uh, an example would be Jacques Derrida, uh, who is mainly known for his work in deconstruction. And a lot of his work is dedicated to opening philosophy to new kinds of questions. So questions like ghosts and how does justice relate to an experience of being haunted? 
Uh, and he uses Shakespeare's Hamlet as an example of that, where justice is in fact related to a haunting kind of experience. And so then he turns philosophical inquiry onto these new kinds of subjects. Um, so deconstruction is a great example of that kind of thing. Um, also you have the move, uh, process philosophy is a great example of philosophers doing away with the boundary that keeps philosophy and science and theology separate. And they're starting to see how science and theology and philosophy all intersect. Um, and then obviously feminist philosophy would contribute to that. Uh, Post-colonial theory is another important contribution for including the philosophical voices of um, Latin America or of colonized countries in general. So all these things are examples of philosophy really becoming much more open, uh, including open to practices so that it isn't just an armchair uh, sort of cognitive endeavor, but is something that involves the body. And that's certainly one of the things that I think attracted both Elizabeth and me to um, PCC was it was a place where that was how philosophy was understood. Is this this new, much more creative endeavor, much more open to new modes of thinking, including other perspectives and including the dimension of practice and embodiment that's normally left out of a lot of traditional philosophical thinking. Now, I wonder if you could speak to the specific role that the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program has within this sort of large picture that you just sketched for us. Um, it seems that you just summarized several different fields of inquiry. Are those all happening in PCC? Or, or how is PCC in dialogue with these things? Where does that kind of conversation happen there? Right. Um, yeah, with anything, you know, the faculty only know so much. Yeah. And they yeah. have their areas of interest. And one of the things that separates this faculty from others is the extent to which they're open to alternative perspectives that might be new to them, or just things that for one reason or another um, aren't part of their expertise. And so in a way, all of those different things I was mentioning are there and so many more and uh, between the students and the faculty. And it's constantly changing. Um, like right now, somebody like Derrida is only starting to be considered within PCC. And in years past, uh, his work just wasn't really tended to because um, none of the faculty really had that much of an interest, none of the students had that much of an interest. And gradually that's shifted. So we're starting to have some of Derrida's texts being read in class, and we're starting to have more students engaging that material. Um, and then showing how that stuff relates to what's already going on in PCC, where some of the more strong philosophy uh, traditions that are represented would be something like process philosophy, where you have people like Pierre Teilhard de Chardin or Henri Bergson in France, um, or in the Anglo-American community of Alfred North Whitehead. Um, so those philosophers are, are more strongly represented. Um, or we also do really well with 19th century German philosophy, like mm -hmm. people like Hegel and Nietzsche. Um, so some of those things are represented and other things the students are starting to bring in or uh, new faculty are starting to explore. So it's exceptionally diverse and open. Um, so giving a really concrete meaning to what academic freedom is supposed to be about, where any perspective is really welcome. Now, Elizabeth, I'd like to ask you um, what you think of this word integral. Why, why do we call it integral studies? Um, I understand that there are several possible perspectives on that, but I'd like to hear yours. Um. In a way, we, you can say integral is, is a sense of, of listening to many different perspectives and trying to take into account um, the perspectives from, from everybody who's participating in a particular subject or a particular region. Um, it's also a way to think about multiple ways of knowing. Mm. So, so integral in the sense of, of doing philosophy not just as an intellectual endeavor, but also a somatic, an aesthetic, um, a, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways to learn. What are the commonalities or what's the significance of integral? See, I think Elizabeth's right that it's extremely diverse and it's really hard to put your finger on and every community kind of sees it differently. Um, but there's something, you know, I mean, integral is like an integer, like it's a whole. And there's a commitment to trying to not understand things in a fragmented way but understand things as an interconnected whole, an interconnected and flowing whole. Um, so that commitment to holism over against any kind of fragmentation or reductionism is a big part of uh, what ties all these different meanings of integral together, 
whether it's Sri Aurobindo or Jean Gebser or um, the more contemporary example being Ken Wilber. Uh, all these different senses of integral have so many different approaches, but they all come together in saying we want to avoid the fragmentation and the alienation, the dissociation that characterizes so much of our current worldview and to start bringing things back together, to get, and which would mean things like rebalancing gender roles, also overcoming dualisms between self and other, or subject and object, or spirit and matter, like we heard with the example with Chi. Mm -hmm. And so any effort to overcome fragmentation or reductionism is in a way an effort to become more integral. Now, Elizabeth, I want to return to you again because um, you, I know you did some research in uh, the field of water and religion. And we've talked about the significance of philosophy for ecology, but I want to hear a little bit more about religion and ecology. Um, what is that? Well, there's an emerging field of religion and ecology that, that is taking place right now. And um, a really big hub for this emerging field is the Forum on Religion and Ecology that's based at Yale University right now. Mm -hmm. And this forum emerged from conferences that took place 1996 to 1999 that brought together people that could, could talk about different religious traditions in light of ecological issues. So there were conferences on Christianity and ecology, on indigenous traditions and ecology, on Islam and ecology, and so on. Now, Elizabeth, you do work with this forum on religion and ecology, is that right? Yes. Yeah, Sam and I have both been working for the forum for the last few years. Right now we're the website managers and the newsletter editors. And our role with, with this forum is to help people from around the world, it's an international forum, um, help them know what's going on in, within this emerging field of religion and ecology. So we let people know about different conferences and events that are taking place, new publications that, that are out now. Um, different, we, we have different focuses um, mm -hmm. of, of you know, whatever is going, out, going on in the world with this field of religion and ecology. So do you mean just scholarly events or are you referring to any kind of uh, significant event? Well, there's a lot of organizations. I don't think um, it wouldn't be timely to mention them all. Yes. It's actually an extremely vast field. I mean, really, this is one of the most cutting-edge things happening on the planet today. Uh, I mean, there's about 7 billion people on the planet, and like 2 billion of them are Christians, and a couple billion Muslims. We have a billion Hindus. So if you're going to address anything, you have to address it in terms of religious worldviews. And what the Forum on Religion and Ecology is dedicated to is helping this movement happen where religions are trying to become relevant to their time. Mm -hmm. And we're living in a time that's characterized by extremely complex environmental issues. So for religions to maintain their relevance, they have to basically enter a new ecological phase of their development. And we're seeing that all across the board, whether it's you know, the Pope or uh, Patriarch Bartholomew or the Dalai Lama religious leaders and religious communities all over the planet are starting to take notice of environmental issues and religions are changing and environmental practices are changing and they're starting to really influence one another um, with grassroots organizations, religious groups, congregations that are trying to become more sustainable. Um, so it's really a wide and diverse movement where people are rethinking the very deepest questions about what it means to be human. All the questions that religion answers. Who are we? What are we doing here? Where are we going? How should I relate to the rest of the world? What should I do with myself? All those fundamental questions of, that religion responds to are all being answered anew. They're all being revised and reconstructed and reevaluated in light of this new context. And that context is the environmental crisis, but it's also the new story that science is giving us. The story that ecology tells us that allows us to see that we have environmental problems. Uh, and obviously that's then rooted in the evolutionary story, mm -hmm. where we realize that we're in a, a universe that's continually changing. So any sense of stability has kind of been lost and there's a much more unstable, dynamic, transformative environment that we're living in. And so because of that, you see religious worldviews just like philosophies saying that, okay, well this is what we're gonna start responding to. 
is this dynamic, changing, transformative, uh, complex situation. And that's sort of what ecology, in a way, stands for. It's all these new complex relationships that humans are starting to find themselves in the midst of. Complex relationships and just the immensity of the universe. Um, and so in a way, what the form on religion ecology is doing is very much based upon the work of the cultural historian and, and geologian Thomas Berry, um, who did a lot of work showing that religions and philosophies need to come to terms with the story of evolution and the story of ecology and start transforming our relationship to the earth. Not just thinking of religion as about human to human relations or human to divine relations, but seeing religion also as about human earth relations or human cosmos relations. Mm -hmm. um, so his work has been extremely influential. So along with our work with the Forum on Religion Ecology, um, we also work uh, with the Thomas Berry website. Uh, and Thomas is very influenced by uh, Teilhard, who I mentioned earlier as an example of a process philosopher. Um, and so that's all connected. We also do work for the American Teilhard Association, uh, working with their website. Um, and on the PCC faculty, uh, Brian Swim is most representative of that position. He worked with Thomas and studied under Thomas, so is also very influenced by Teilhard. Um, and so in conjunction with Mary Evelyn Tucker, who works for the Forum, um, Brian is uh, putting together a movie right now called The Journey of the Universe, which is again about how humanity is coming to learn its new place in the universe, coming to learn the new story about who we are, how we got here, where we're going, what it all means. Um, and it's an integral story. It's trying to bring together all those aspects of our lives that have been dissociated or fragmented um, and bringing together a deeper whole, which would give people a, de uh, give people a deeper sense of purpose and meaning um, and a renewed zest for life. Thank you both for joining us and sharing your wisdom and experience with us, Elizabeth and Sam. My name is Aaron, and thank you for joining us, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you.